heard the Hanukkah blessing earlier. So I want to tell you a little bit more about how this holiday uh, got started and, and some of the stories around uh, the Festival of Lights. So um, this is a story that has been told many times, and this is one version of it. Long ago, before even our grandparents' grandparents' grandparents were alive, the land of Israel was ruled by a wicked king named Antiochus. King Antiochus counted many Jewish people among his subjects, but he was not Jewish. Just like so many Jewish people today, those ancestors lived their lives according to Jewish customs, and they celebrated Shabbat every week, and they marked the festivals of Passover and other Jewish festivals. And unlike the Jewish people today, however, they worshiped at the ancient temple in the city of Jerusalem, and that was really the center of their faith, the holiest of all holy places to the Jewish people, the center of Jewish life. But King Antiochus did not want to rule over a nation of many cultures and many religions. He wanted to rule one nation with one religion and one culture only. He wanted all the people in his land to live the way that he lived and to pray the way that he prayed according to his Greek customs. And this meant that he did not want the Jewish people to be able to dress differently or worship differently or eat differently than the Greek people did. Now, under King Antiochus, the practice of Judaism was made illegal. It was against the law. He forbid the Jews from celebrating Shabbat, their weekly ritual. And he forbid the Jews from observing any of their holy festivals, their holidays. He also forbid the Jews from reading or studying the Torah, their holy book. But perhaps worst of all, he forbid the Jewish worship inside the temple, this very holy place in Jerusalem. And he turned the temple into a place that was dirty and uh, messed up and very, very unholy. He made a mess by setting up other religious idols inside the temple and turning over the tables and the chairs and, the, um, and the, some of the statues and some of the other um, religious rituals, uh, items of ritual that they had in the temple. Now, many Jews were, were afraid for their lives during this time, and they, they felt like they were forced to follow the king's orders. But there was one group of brave souls who decided that they wouldn't submit to the king, that they wouldn't worship foreign gods or give up their way of life. And this group was called the Maccabees. They were determined to take back the temple and defend their religious freedom. And I want to think, stop here for a minute and think about how we would feel if someone came in here and destroyed our chalice and messed up our walls and knocked over our, our precious things that mean a lot to us, that things that we see each week, things that are very sacred to us, very special. That's how the Jewish people felt when the temple was destroyed. So the Maccabees tried to fight against this order of King Antiochus. Compared with the king's army, though, they were very small and, and didn't have many members of their army. But they were mighty in spirit. With their faith and their relentless determination, the Maccabees won an unbelievable victory over the king's army, the much more powerful forces. And they fought hard, and against all odds, they won. Now, they successfully took back the temple from King Antiochus. But when they got inside, they were heartbroken to, dis to see how it had been destroyed and defiled. That means it had been made dirty and not holy anymore. So they got to work. They knew that 
one of the most important things was not just to take over the temple again, but to make it a holy place again, to warm the people's hearts by knowing that it was it was restored to its former beauty and holiness. So they did that. They cleaned it up and they made a new menorah, which is, um, uh, you saw one in the video, it's a, um, a candelabra, it's a, it's a group of candles. There wasn't one, it had been broken, so they made a new one. And they looked around and they couldn't find any oil. These, these um, menorahs were oil lamps, like, like this chalice, rather than uh, using candles. They couldn't find any oil except for one tiny little vial of oil that wasn't even going to last for one day. But they decided to go ahead and light the candles anyway and hope for the best. And that is when the really beautiful thing happened in the Hanukkah story, which is that the oil, which was really only supposed to last for less than a day, lasted for eight days. And it burned, and the people knew that God was with them, and that God had appreciated their restoration of the temple, and made this oil burn as a sign of his love. So today, the Hanukkah celebration, because of that, lasts for eight days in honor of that miracle that happened all that time ago. These eight candles on the menorah are lit, one candle on the first night, another candle on the second night, and so on and so on until they are all lit. And oily foods like latkes, potato pancakes are eaten. Um, to remember the oil that lasted for eight days. And other uh, fun things for the kids like dreidels and the giving of geld, little gold coins, uh, is another part of the Hanukkah celebration. With every Hanukkah candle that's lit, we illuminate the most important message of all, which is that we must always work to find light in the darkness, and we must always work to keep the light of religious freedom burning for all the people, all the time. Thank you. I have a friend who changed her name when she was a young adult after a spiritual experience so powerful that she felt like she'd become a different person. And she changed her name to Grace. I asked her once why she chose that name. And she said that she wanted to keep that, that lit up from inside feeling that she had for the rest of her life. She said that it was the thing that she needed to have with her always. That Grace was the one thing she always needed more of. Now at the time, I didn't ask her for her exact definition of grace. I wish I had. It's a difficult word, isn't it? Because we make it mean so many things in English. We use it to describe the studied and expert movements of a dancer. Or we use it as the name for the words of gratitude that we say before a meal. We say that someone who loses a game or an election should exhibit grace in accepting their loss. We talk about grace the way we talk about beauty or art or talent. It's hard to describe, but we know it when we see it. Now the classical definition of grace, at least in Christianity, comes from Martin Luther the founder of the Lutheran denomination of Protestantism and, and the founder of Protestantism. Grace is a gift to an imperfect human race from their perfect creator who lives, who loves them even though, right? Even though, even though we don't really deserve it and we'll never really live up to it and can't really return it. Grace is unearned. It is undeserved. And we can neither accept it 
nor deny it. It belongs to God only. But the way our language throws this term around tells me otherwise. The way we use this term says that we humans can also be filled with grace, but maybe only at moments, whether through physical dexterity that takes our breath away or a sudden awareness of profound gratitude, or in those moments of defeat when displaying extraordinary acceptance and humility. And so we've come to talk even of the grace that we give to one another at times when relationships are difficult or at times when our tempers are high, at times when situations seem quite intractable, at times of struggle and pain. Give each other a little grace, we say, or give the situation a little bit of grace and see what happens. At such times, we talk about grace as if it's a, a kind of a space, a kind of a spaciousness that we can apply to a relationship or a situation that gives it a chance to make a shift, gives it a chance to embrace its possibilities. In that way, we can see it as similar to what the Maccabees did when they put that oil in the menorah. They were struggling, they didn't think it was all going to work, but they gave it a chance. Maybe that was grace. I've come to my own definition of grace from, from all of these things, and for me it encompasses all of those ways that we use the word. And I'm really less interested in where it comes from, to be honest with you, than in how we can manifest more of it in our world. So whether it's really a gift from God or something that we find inside ourselves, that's not the important part to me. To me, grace is an action or a quality that briefly, briefly reminds all of us around of the divine presence that dwells in everything, in all of us and all of creation at all times. It's those shimmering moments when the dullness of ordinary life slips away and the reality of life, that shining, sacred, interconnected nature of oneness that's in everything is revealed. Like the oil in the temple that burned for eight days, it's the transformation of something quite ordinary into something extraordinary. But it starts with that hopeful act of giving something space, like the act of the Maccabees, creating that new menorah in the temple and lighting it, even though they didn't think it would be enough to last the night. Stories like these can teach us that we really are enough if only we'll do what we can and trust the possibilities of life to help with the rest. And whether our theology centers on a creator God or whether we look to nature and science for the answers and for the sacred, we can all learn from ancient traditions that center us in hope when prospects look dim. We can help others around us whose lights have gone out, whoever we are and whatever our resources. When our hearts are open, there's always something that we can give to the situation. One of my favorite Hanukkah teachings is about the shamash, the helper candle. It's the one in the middle of the menorah. Sometimes it's a little bit lower than the others. Sometimes it's a little higher. It's the one in the middle. You'll notice there are nine candles. You see, sometimes during the eight nights of Hanukkah, the other eight candles sometimes might go out for whatever reason, a little draft or a little breeze or a part of a wick that didn't catch properly. 
And when this happens, they need the shamash to relight them. But each of us can be a shamash to one another at different times. Here is a wonderful teaching story that I want to share from you, from, with you from Elizabeth Gilbert, the writer. It's about an ordinary person who becomes a shamash, offering grace and connection and encouragement for a whole group of strangers on an ordinary day. She writes, some years ago, I was stuck on a crosstown bus in New York City during rush hour. Traffic was barely moving. The bus was filled with cold, tired people who were deeply irritated with each other and with the world itself. Two men barked at each other about a shove that may or may not have been intentional. A pregnant woman got on and nobody offered her a seat. Rage was in the air, and no mercy would be found here. But as the bus approached 7th Avenue, the driver got onto the intercom. Folks, he said, I know you've had a rough day, and I know you're frustrated. I can't do anything about the weather or the traffic, but here's what I can do. As each one of you gets off the bus, I'm going to reach out my hand to you. As you walk by, drop your troubles into the palm of my hand, OK? Don't take your problems home to your families tonight. Just leave them with me. My route goes right by the Hudson River. And when I drive by there later, I'll open the window and throw your troubles right in the water. It was as if a spell had lifted. Everyone burst out laughing. Faces gleamed with surprised delight. People who'd been pretending for the past hour not to notice each other's existence were suddenly looking in each other's eyes and grinning at each other. Like, is this guy serious? Oh, he was serious. At the next stop, just as promised, the driver reached out his hand, palm up, and waited. One by one, all the exiting commuters placed their hand just above his and mimed the gesture of dropping something into his palm. Some people laughed as they did it, some teared up, but everyone did it. The driver repeated that same lovely ritual at the next stop, too, and the next all the way to the river. Gilbert goes on to say, we live in a hard world, my friends. Sometimes it is extra difficult to be a human being. Sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you have a bad day that lasts for several years. You struggle and you fail. You lose jobs, money, friends, faith, and love. You witness horrible events unfolding in the news, and you become fearful and withdrawn. There are times when everything seems cloaked in darkness. You long for the light, but you don't know where to find it. But what if, what if you are the light? What if you are the very agent of illumination? The very agent of illumination that a dark situation begs for. That's what this bus driver taught me. That anyone can be the light at any moment. This guy wasn't some big power player. He wasn't a spiritual leader. He wasn't some media savvy influencer. He was a bus driver, one of our society's most invisible, yet essential workers. But he possessed real power, and he used it beautifully for the benefit of the people on that bus. 
When life feels especially grim or when I feel particularly powerless in the face of the world's troubles, Gilbert says, I think of this man and I ask myself, what can I do right now to be the light? Of course, I can't personally end all wars or solve global warming or transform vexing people into entirely different creatures. I definitely can't control traffic. But I do have some influence on everyone I brush up against, even if we never speak or even learn each other's names. No matter who you are, or where you are, or how, how mundane or tough your situation might seem, I believe you can illuminate your world. In fact, I believe this is the only way the world will ever be illuminated. One bright act of grace at a time, all the way to the river. In this season, at this time in the history of planet Earth, it's extra, extra hard to be a human being. We may feel even more disempowered, lost, confused. And for a lot of us imperfect creatures, that translates into a crankiness, a bitterness, a cynicism or a cold, brewing anger. In such a world at this time, it's helpful to remember stories. It's helpful to remember that each of us can be a candle that restores someone else's light simply by being present and embracing divine possibilities inherent within us and within everyone else. We cannot solve the world's problems. Sometimes we can't even solve our own problems. But by finding a tiny bit of grace, we can help. We can help turn the lights on. We can help to not let them go out. We may think what we have to give is hardly enough to share, but when we take that small action, we discover that it has a much bigger impact on ourselves, on the world, than we could ever have imagined. So, this December, don't let the light of hope, of grace, of patience go out. This December, let's embody the Maccabees, taking the time to make a menorah and light it, even when everything around seems lost and resources seem feeble. This December, let's be the shamash, the helper candle, whenever we can. Whenever we see someone else whose light is going out, do what we can to remind them that hope can still light the way. This December, be that bus driver finding a way to bring grace to the most ordinary parts of the daily grind, even if you feel a little silly doing it. Let's each of us ask ourselves, what can I do right now to be the light? And then, let's bring it. Our closing words for today's service are from Darcy Roke. There is too much hardship in this world not to find joy every day. There is too much injustice in this world not to right the balance every day. There is too much pain in this world not to heal it every day. Each of us each of us ministers to a weary world. Let us go forth now and do that which calls us to make the world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of the divine every day. <laughs>